Hello and welcome to the Week in 60 Minutes, brought to you by Spectator TV and broadcast on Thursday the 2nd of November. I'm John Connolly, The Spectator's news editor and your host this week. Coming up on the show. Is the COVID inquiry asking the wrong questions? I'll speak to Carl Hennigan and Kate Andrews. Is Hezbollah going to open up a second front against Israel? Sarit Zahavi will join me. Fraser Nelson speaks to Jonathan Haidt about whether phones are harming children's mental health. And Toby Young looks at why the conversion therapy bill is a bad idea. Before we get going, if you like Spectator TV, do subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thousands are joining our channel every week and you could be one of them. Just click the subscribe button at the bottom of this video and tap the bell icon so you never miss an episode. And thank you as well to our sponsors, Canaccord Genuity Wealth Management. Canaccord are experienced wealth planners and investment managers who offer unwavering support during challenging times. To find out more, visit candowealth.com for more information. First up, what is wrong with the COVID inquiry? Professor Carl Hennigan from the University of Oxford writes in this week's cover piece that is failing to look at whether lockdowns work. To join me, Carl joins me now alongside our economics editor, Kate Andrews. Brilliant. Thank you, Carl. And thank you, Kate, for joining us. Um, Carl writes in the magazine this week as as part of our cover piece about the COVID inquiry and about what it's looking at and in particular what it's not looking at. Um, It's been in the news a lot this week because Dominic Cummings and Lee Kane have appeared in front of the inquiry. Uh, Kate, to to start us off, what what have you made of the inquiry so far? I think one of the big concerns around this inquiry, John, wasn't just how long it was going to take, but that there might be a predetermined set of conclusions that the inquiry was was trying to seek out, predominantly that lockdown didn't happen fast enough and that it wasn't hard enough. And I'm afraid to say I think some of those fears may be coming to light. And, and, and I don't say that casually. Look at what we had when Professor Ferguson took the stand. We had a very strange set of questions, which insisted that Professor Ferguson hadn't been a big enough advocate for lockdown, that he hadn't done enough to warn the government. Now, there are lots of things that you can level at what he was called at the time, Professor Lockdown. But the idea that he wasn't encouraging lockdown or wasn't making this information clear to government is just certainly not one of them. Indeed, he was messaging, emailing number 10, almost acknowledging that that was a bit above and beyond his remit, but he wanted to let them know his views on the situation and and how strongly uh, he felt uh, about the need for intervention. So this idea that of all people, Professor Ferguson is being asked why he didn't do enough to advocate lockdown, I think does suggest that there is a particular uh, set of ideas and of a very narrow interpretation of the so-called science, which I know, I know Carl gets into in his piece for the magazine this week, uh, that they really want to, to advocate for in this inquiry. And it's not obvious to me whatsoever that that is the right way to be going about this. We, we need to be questioning every assumption that was made. We need to be questioning every bit of policy and law that was implemented around this, whether or not it yielded the right results, not simply did they do it too loosely? Should it have been harder and should it have been faster? And we should say at this point, Carl, as well as writing about the inquiry for us this week, you've also appeared in front of the inquiry, which was which was last week. Um, when you were in front of the inquiry, did you get the sense, as Kate says there, that, that the inquiry was coming from a very particular ideological bent and the questions to you were more about imposing that ideology than, than finding out what, what needed to be found out? So, yeah, look, I think Kate's got it spot on, actually. But let, let me just explain what happened is I was asked to submit written evidence. And that written evidence was about 74 pages, about 23,000 words. And I tried to keep it succinct because I could have carried on for quite some time. And in that evidence, there were about 12 issues that were identified. I was going to go to the inquiry and ask to be uh, an oral witness and present and talk about. I actually thought we was going to go there and give an, a, a position to start to unpick some of these issues. Why is the mathematical modelling used so much, given its track record of getting it so wrong? Why are we using that? And actually, if you look at the inquiry, it seems to be saying the modelling is de facto evidence and not actually looking at the assumptions that go into it and saying, well, actually, every prediction in the in the whole COVID pandemic was incorrect. But what happened when it got there? 
Well, something that actually concerned me. My evidence was cut short and about 20 minutes before they introduced a load of new documents and said, we're going to discuss this and we're going to start to go into your character, who you are, who, why am I there to make decisions and influence the issues, if you like. And that's largely because of what happened on the 20th of September when Sinetra Gupta, myself and Anders Tegnell met with the Prime Minister to discuss the issues at hand. And I I, I discussed this, actually, within the article. There are over 200 sage advisors, yet within those advisors, they couldn't find somebody to provide an alternative viewpoint or actually robustly ask questions about the assumptions and the data we were using to that point. So actually, when you look at the inquiry, it's failing to ask the important question, particularly do lockdowns work? Should we do lockdowns next time? If so, what sort of evidence should we base them on? And particularly, what are the widespread harms that occur when you do lockdown that actually you need to take into account that would then give you what happens in healthcare is a normal is to take a, a, a basis of a decision based on the net benefit to harm ratio. And if the harm's outweigh the benefits, you don't go there. Mm. I mean, Carl, at the inquiry, you kind of asked a bit about your own credentials and whether or not you're qualified to speak about this kind of thing. Do you think that's kind of part of part of the problem mindset, perhaps, that the, the inquiry wants to sort of label people into good and bad scientists and decide which are the good ones we should listen to? Well, it certainly felt that way because other witnesses who've gone there have been able to lay out the whole of their credibility. But what they wanted to do was go, here's what you published in 2018-19. And you didn't publish on SARS-CoV-2, by the way. And I go, well, nobody was publishing on that. But at that moment in time, I was BMJ editor-in-chief. I totally revamped the journal and created a new series about healthcare decision-making. It also didn't go back into my past experience and particularly say, I'm an active clinician. I've actually worked in the past pandemic, looking at swine flu, government appearances. It dismissed all that. And i that's the point when you're in a position like that and you're under the caution effect. What happened is I suddenly realized there was a change of direction here. This is not feeling as though I'm here to establish the truth. It's more to undermine my credibility. And what happens in that position, I think, all you can ever do is try and get out of there with your reputation intact because it felt like nobody was listening and all I was doing was being under attack. And I think what they really wanted me to do was lose my call and then use that to discredit a certain viewpoint. I think that was unacceptable. There is a real story to be told and evidence to be brought forward by what we call the other side, but actually those who want to produce an evidence-based approach. And actually, I was the only witness that's called from that position, despite the fact I think the public, huge swathes of the media, understand that's an important discussion and debate that has to be had. Mm. Okay, I think that brings us nicely on to what happened during the inquiry this week, and in particular, the inquiry's focus on bad language, uh, abusive statements made by various people privately inside Number 10 and out. Um, why do you think there's been such that focus by the inquiry on sort of on name calling rather than perhaps more substantive issues? It's almost as if, John, the inquiry thinks that the news is in the fact that these rude words were bandied about and that these messages were sent. I'm, I'm not going to repeat most of them. I know Carl had one um, directed at him, which was extreme, extremely rude uh, by Professor Dame Angela McLean, uh, who's now the chief scientific advisor. Uh, I won't repeat that one, but she also called Rishi Sunak Dr. Death in relation to his eat out to help out policy. Um, and of course, this makes for great politics. But in my opinion, the news is not actually these rude words that were used. We can talk about the tone and and the attitudes within government, sure, we talk about that all the time. The real question is, you know, put put the rude words aside. Were any of these attacks or claims justified? What did Eat Out to Help Out really do? Uh, was questioning some of that modeling at the time the right or wrong thing to do. My frustration with this inquiry is that the focus is on personalities and individuals. That's easy because a lot of the individuals and personalities involved are um, you know, truly spectacular and it makes for good television, it makes for a good inquiry. Um, but if we want to have a better, more robust policy when it comes to pandemics in the future, The question that's been on my mind and continues to be on my mind, and I haven't had any answers to yet, is were those models and were the assumptions going into those models 
correct. You know, if we just take one example, Sage was saying that at the height um, of COVID, you would have 90,000 hospital beds with ventilators needed. I think at the peak, it was closer to 2,500 and almost half of the ventilators on the NHS weren't used. I want to know, names aside, you know, rude comments aside, whether or not um, we think that it was right to question those models, whether we think enough people did question those models, whether with Eat Out to Help Out, the right trade-offs were ever considered between the pandemic and every other aspect of society and public life and every other illness that people were suffering from that was keeping them away from the NHS, that was leading people to lose their jobs and the rest of it. Um, we have not gotten into the details of that. Instead, the explosive news stories from the perspective of the inquiry seem to be who called what when. Uh, and uh, yeah, it, it makes for good television, but frankly, it's not, I don't think it's making us any safer for the future when the next pandemic comes along. Let's be clear, the language that's being used is completely unacceptable. And what needs to happen is it needs to be called out. What we think should happen now is all these diaries and all these WhatsApp messages should just be published in full. And then there should be a statement across government to say, this is completely unacceptable. And actually there needs to be a change in culture. You just wouldn't accept that in the workplace. So why should we accept it at the head of government? The second point, once you've dismissed with that, then we can get back to the business of understanding what the lessons should be learned. That's what we're about. And that's what the inquiry is about. Second, I wanted to make a point about Dominic Cummings and both Neil Ferguson were asked about why they broke lockdown. And they went into apologetic mode and said, well, sorry. But the point is, that's not the point. The point that should be looked at to is with people who broke lockdown and had parties, Surely there was a mismatch between the fear messaging they were producing and how they were behaving in the real world. So they could not or believed the messages and the risks that were being put out to the public. Because would you go and break them if there was a killer virus out there? Certainly not. And this is the key issue in the in the inquiry to me is, do you need legal restrictions to mandate people to do things? Or as in Sweden, can you trust the population to understand the risks and behave appropriately? And therefore, that's where when you look at ICU capacity and all that, somebody should have brought in and Ferguson did do a model for Sweden. That was incorrect because you can see that because they didn't lock down. Now, bringing in the Swedish data starts to allow you to show the incorrectness of the modeling approach, because it all breaks down when you've got a control group like Sweden. Why is that not happening? Because we're completely distracted by this messaging of which I assume is gonna be more and more, apart from the Scottish inquiry bit of this inquiry, because it seems they've deleted all their messages, which again is wholly inappropriate, because government should be transparent. And a good example of this is what happens in the USA. Because in the USA, all of the devices and all the emails have to be kept in full. And just like Hillary Clinton, she was in deep trouble when she started to use private emails. So they shouldn't be performing government functions in the background and deleting messages. They should be open in the, in the public arena. Mm. Uh, Kate, on, on Carl's point there about the Sweden comparisons particularly, I mean, Obviously, it's not entirely conclusive at this stage, but it does look as though Sweden has done particularly well in excess deaths, which is one of the, the better ways of measuring how countries yeah. did in the pandemic. Do you get the sense that the inquiry has been particularly good at looking at international comparisons, perhaps? Or do you think it's, it's a bit too myopic at this stage and just very much focused on what was going on inside number 10 rather than looking elsewhere? It's very much focused on what was going on inside number 10. And look, I'm very happy to keep the government accountable. I think I'm one of the handful of people left in the UK that is still infuriated every day by Partygate. The fact that, as Carl says, people were living one way and instructing and actually sending the police after people if they dare to do anything similar. So I'm all for keeping government accountable here. But the wider point about public safety and real public health is whether or not the right decisions were made to keep the largest number of people alive and healthy. Um, and there's been a lot of scrutiny, for example, around one of Boris Johnson's messages this week. It's been put to Dominic Cummings and Lee Kane from the WhatsApps, where he uses 
frankly, crass language to talk about COVID, but questions whether or not more lockdowns are necessary given the fact that the average age of somebody passing away from COVID is above the average life expectancy age. He's asking questions about NHS capacity. Again, the news story is that Boris Johnson writes this in a rather crass way. If you break down what he's asking, they are very, very legitimate points. We should have been looking at quality numbers, the quality of life for years lost. We should have been looking at the impact on excess deaths, deaths not just COVID deaths, because we are now in a situation with a 7.6 million waiting list on NHS England alone, where the NHS is truly overwhelmed, where you have people who are very young finding out that they have developed cancer. You have tragic situations now because of that very extreme stay-at-home messaging. I think what countries like Sweden taught us is, is not that people were going to keep going about their daily lives when we had this new mystery virus going around, but actually that you don't always need to bring in the harshest laws, that you can trust people to make cautious, good decisions, and that actually that trust that Sweden put in their public has led to fewer people dying overall. You know, that, that is a hugely positive thing and something that we have to take away for the next pandemic. But unfortunately, comments based on the way that they're worded in these WhatsApp messages are being scrutinized for you know very surface level kinds of language. They're not being scrutinized for the actual content of it, uh, which is clearly what we should be doing. And unfortunately, it's just not happening yet. And, and finally, to finish this off, Carl, I mean, COVID probably won't be the last pandemic that happens, hopefully, hopefully nothing like it in, in the immediate future. But do you get the sense after sort of participating with the inquiry and been writing for us this week, that the country is any is going to have learned any of the lessons from the past few years the next time a pandemic comes along. Do you mind if I come in on the excess death issues you mentioned about where we are? Because it is crucial and I, I'm sorry to... No, of course. No, go ahead. Look, as we sit here about just over three years into the pandemic, three and a half, and it's come to an end, there are countries that have done really well in that period. One of them is Denmark. They have no excess deaths when you look at their data. And it's quite interesting. It's really interesting. I've been looking to them. Well, they have an amazing social care provision, I consider, that actually is worth looking at. But there are countries that have done badly, like Belgium, which is generally because I think they've got an incredibly poor care home sector. So it's that issue at, at the expect, looking at the extremes will allow you to understand what's going on. But if we look at the data, say, in England, and I wanted, this is one of the things, in, in the round, there's about 165,000 excess deaths over the three and a half years. Yeah? Now, importantly, if you look in hospitals, there's about 60,000 excess deaths. But actually, if you count the number of COVID deaths, there's 140,000. So if you looked at the COVID deaths, you just go, oh, 140,000 deaths in hospital. And then you equate that to excess. That's a mistake. But there is one area where there's an excess death problem which I think reveals an awful lot that needs to be looked at. And you can look at this on the Office for Health and Income Disparities, Improvement and Disparities website. It's a great website, provides you with the data and the images. In the home, there was 108,000 excess deaths, of which only 12,800, about 12% were down to COVID. That can't be an underreporting because we're testing everybody on the death certificates. We're more likely to do it. So the story of this pandemic, the restrictions and everything we've done is that there's been a huge excess deaths in our own homes that not nearly 90 percent of it is not down to COVID. So if we were going to learn a lesson, we'd start to break down the data, dive into it and go, well, what's going on? And then the government would go. Let's investigate what's going on and understand the drivers so we can learn lessons. And in doing so, that's how an inquiry would get to somewhere near the truth. But like you say, is it doesn't seem to want to go there. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Carl. And thank you, Kate. Hassan Nasrallah, the General Secretary of Hezbollah, is giving his first public speech tomorrow since the Hamas attacks on Israel on October 7th. Will he open up another front in the war? I'm joined now by Sarit Zahavi, founder of the Alma Research Centre on the border with Lebanon. Sarit, thank you for joining us on Spectator TV. Um, you're in northern Israel at the moment, only 12 kilometres from the border with Lebanon. Uh, currently, there are lots of attacks going there uh, from, from Hezbollah with Israel responding in turn. Can you describe what the situation is like up there at the moment? I can tell you that uh, tonight we hardly slept. Uh, we heard the fightings. Uh, 
It was difficult to explain to my little girl. This is from a personal point of view. To describe it, uh, it's kind of a low-scale war. I'll put it maybe this way, a limited war, because uh, since uh, the war started, up north, there are daily attacks that are coming from Lebanon, either anti-tanks, UAVs, mortars, missiles, infiltration, you name it. Uh, while most of the attacks are anti-tanks and mortars, and most of these, or actually all of these, are coming from Hezbollah. Some infiltrations were carried out by Islamic Jihad, and some missiles were launched by Hamas as well. But the leading player against the state of Israel from the Israeli-Lebanese border is Hezbollah. We also had a few launching of missiles from Syria uh, three times until now. And what is actually happening is that very quickly IDF understood that uh, it needs to be dealt. And every uh, squad of Hezbollah that reaches to the area of the border and tries to launch whatever it is, whether it's anti-tank or mortars, or sometimes they even try to target our UAVs with, with the uh, a, a surface-to-air missiles. All of these are dealt by the IDF, and the IDF is destroying these uh, squads and killing Hezbollah operatives. So in many, pla in many places, uh, when, when I hear international media, it is reported as exchange of fire. But I don't, expect, I don't accept this framing, since I think it's not exactly exchange of fire. There is no interest for the IDF to exchange fire with Hezbollah. And there is no interest for the IDF to open another front. But this second front is already active from day one against us. And that's why eventually it needs to be dealt. As for the civilian part, 60,000 Israelis were evacuated from the communities next to the border, zero to five kilometers. I myself live about nine kilometers from the border. So me and my family we were not evacuated. But the feeling here is, as I've said, is a feeling of a low scale or a limited war because it's not quiet. Uh, it, it's not a border of peace and quietness. And I don't live anymore in the, the peaceful community I used to live because there are soldiers everywhere. And it is clear to us that the IDF is prepared for something much greater than maybe Hezbollah is planning. Mm. I was going to say, so um, Hassan Najrallah, the general secretary of Hezbollah, is due to speak tomorrow. Do you get the sense, I mean, obviously we're talking ahead of that, we can't know exactly what he's going to say, but can you maybe just talk us through about what Hezbollah are thinking? Do you think that they have an incentive to expand this into a, into a full-scale war, war rather, than, rather than fire and probing at the moment? So first I agree that we don't know what he's going to say tomorrow, and I would say even more than that, uh, maybe even tomorrow he will not give us all the answers that everybody in the world is like kind of waiting for what Nasrallah will say. Okay, uh, he may leave us with the question marks. But what we see clearly is that uh, Iran is pushing his proxies uh, to become part of this campaign because this was the plan right from the beginning. And here, which brings me to another point, this is not a war between Israel and Hamas. This is very misleading. Hamas didn't initiate all of that by itself. This is a war between uh, Iran and the Western values. And Iran, in the past decade, built its capabilities to create a multi-front campaign against the state of Israel from various fronts, meaning Yemen, which is already active, uh, uh, Gaza, West Bank, Lebanon, Syria, even Iraq, and maybe even inside Israel. This is what they want, okay? The capabilities exist in most of these places, Hezbollah, excellent example. The firepower of Hezbollah is 10 times more than the firepower of Hamas. And until this moment, you know, we don't see any um, messages that are coming out either from Iran or from Hezbollah that are saying, okay, we want to calm down. Maybe we should stop. No. We don't see all of that. The, the propaganda that goes out of Hezbollah is a propaganda that support the expansion of the war, that support, they published today, giving you two examples, published today a video 
that support Yemen under the flag, all of us is Yemen, as if Israel attacked Yemen or whatever, you know, we are not, we have no business with that. But we were attacked already four times by drones and missiles from Yemen. Uh, and uh, another video that was published at the beginning of this week uh, by the propaganda of Hezbollah, emphasizing the capabilities of Hezbollah to carry out exactly what Hamas has already executed uh, on October 7th. While the whole message of this video is that Hezbollah warriors are willing to die for the cause, which is getting to Jerusalem and killing Israelis. That's kind of the bottom line of three minutes video. Mm. So if if the war does expand and Hezbollah launch a full-scale invasion or warfare, how prepared do you think Israel is to fight a war on two fronts? It's quite a challenge, of course. Uh, definitely when we speak of ground forces. That's why I think that the IDF is aware of what is happening up north and the fact that, you know, I'm saying that as a resident of the Gali, we can no longer live with this monster that, you know, just end the war. And one day when they will decide, they will massacre us the same way they did uh, in, in the area of Gaza. Israel must be prepared to deal with uh, the challenge as it is from the north as well. As I've said, it's yes, it's a challenge of ground invasion of Hezbollah commando fighters, and it's a challenge of the missiles and the drones. Some of them are accurate. Uh, in the hands of Hezbollah, 200,000 uh, different kind of, of missiles and drones. Uh, I think what uh, the IDF is now doing is prioritizing, saying, okay, we must uh, push forward in Gaza. There is no way Hamas will be able to survive this. This is something that is unheard of and unacceptable, and we must get rid of the monster over there. And afterwards, we'll see what could be done and in which way it could be, could be done up north. But again, I want to remind everybody that meanwhile, there are 60,000 Israelis that cannot, go, cannot go, go back to their homes up north here because of the threat of the anti-tanks. Mm, I see. Um, we should turn for a little bit to the situation in Gaza. Uh, it's been reported this morning that Israeli troops have reached the edge of Gaza City. Is the perception in Israel that the, the southern campaign is doing well, that it's sort of meeting its targets at, at taking on Hamas? Yes, I think the, the impression is that it is doing well. I think there is a consensus, and we Israelis, we usually disagree upon everything, but here there is a consensus among Israelis that after what happened, uh, there is no way that Hamas will stay and we must do whatever we can to eliminate the threat. Uh, it's, you know, I always compare it to what happened in World War II. Like, uh, did anybody uh, even imagine a scenario that after all what the Nazis had done, they will be able to stay on power? Or that uh, Hitler will stay on power? It was clear to everybody that this enemy should be fought until its defeat. And this is what is clear today is to the Israelis. And I hope that eventually it will be clear to the world because uh, Hamas atrocities, as I've said, uh, we were near them. We were uh, uh, meters away from them. But actually, the hatred is not against Israelis and Jews uh, alone. By the way, Arabs were killed by Hamas as well. Uh, this hatred is also against everything the West represents. Uh, you know, I see uh, support to Hamas coming from uh, LGBTQ or queers, uh, coming from people that believe in democracy and in freedom in various ways, Hamas is not part of what you believe in. Completely not. And if these people will go to visit Gaza uh, as an act of solidarity, they will get killed by Hamas. Yeah, so sorry, there seems to be sort of a discordancy almost, which is that Israel seems very focused, uh, seems very united on its on the necessity of tackling Hamas. Yet in the wider West now, there seems to be a sort of wavering of support for Israel's campaign. Uh, so yesterday we had President Joe Biden say he supported a humanitarian pause. I mean, w what did you make of his comments? Look, I totally understand the need to to meet the needs of the of the Gazians with regard to humanitarian need. But I think that eventually, and it is also due to international law, we must uh, meet the humanitarian needs of the hostages as well. So, okay, if humanitarian aid is getting into Gaza, the, rest, the Red Cross 
should be able to meet our hostages in, in that are in the hands of Hamas. I think this is something that makes sense. It's humanitarian. It's, it's about human's life. And I don't understand why these two demands are not going hand in hand. Mm. Do you think, though, in terms of, do you think, do you get the sense that Western support is going to waver, though, now? I mean, we're going to see this more and more with when Israel, Israel's bombing campaign does have a high civilian toll in Gaza. Do you think we're going to see the West sort of shy away from supporting Israel more and more? It's becoming more difficult for we, Israel. We already see that, uh, unfortunately. And I, I must say something around that. You, you mentioned the amount of casualties in Gaza, which everybody is sorry for that. OK, again, we have no business in killing uh, Gazians because it doesn't serve before morality. OK, it doesn't serve our interests. If we want to defeat Hamas, we want to kill as less Gazians as possible. We understand that the, the way to defeat Hamas goes through as less casualties as possible. We, we all understand that, okay? But what Hamas is doing is, is, is using its own people as human shields. Its headquarters and tunnels are based below the homes. So what the world should do is hold Hamas accountable rather than hold Israel accountable. And my, one more thing around that, Israel is not occupying Gaza in any way since 2005. We are not there. There was no IDF soldiers in Gaza since 2005, except for a specific operation that again happened due to atrocities that were carried out by Hamas and 20 years of rockets that were launched by Hamas and Islamic Jihad to the state of Israel against the communities. Children in Israel grew up afraid to go to the bathroom because of the sirens. People need to address all of that. So I think that the international pressure here is on the, the wrong player. The, to, there should be an international pressure, but there should be international pressure on Hamas itself because he is the one who is putting his own people at risk. He is the one who is doing that deliberately in order to escape from a, from a defeat. And they don't care about the human lives of the Gazians. We uh, call them to evacuate from the war zones. Hamas blocked their way with evacuation. Uh, everybody's talking about the fuel. Hamas has enough fuel. It stole the fuel of the civilians in order to continue to fight us. All of this should be addressed. And I think it's very important to look at the full picture while we speak about the collateral damage and people getting killed. Moreover, I have, you know, just a little bit of, of a question here. Here in Israel, we had a horrifying massacre of Israelis. And it is until today, almost a month had passed and we don't have the exact number of how many people were killed. Hamas is publishing numbers every day. How do they know how many people were killed in each and every attack? How do they know that these were all civilians? The numbers that are coming out of Gaza include the 1,500 terrorists that invaded into Israel and uh, slaughtered our families. The numbers that are coming out of Gaza include the Hamas uh, terrorists that are fighting against the IDF now. Nobody knows what's the numbers exactly, the distinction between civilians and, and uh, terrorists, how they were killed. Nobody knows, and everybody just you know, uh, view Israel uh, as responsible. And I think it's important to look at the, the details in this picture for all of us to be capable of defeating terror because Israel had no interest to go to a military operation in Gaza. And we are doing that because everything that happened, we are doing that because we cannot tolerate another massacre. Thank you very much, Sarit. Are phones to blame for children's deteriorating mental health? Earlier this week at the ARC conference in London, Fraser Nelson spoke to writer and psychologist Jonathan Haidt. Well, thanks for joining us from, from New York. Now, um, Jonathan, Miriam spoke in there about family breakdown and mental health. You've been doing a lot of work on the relationship between social media and mental health. You've got a new book coming on this theme next year. Um, Two questions, how strong is the link so far? And also, does it, can you say a bit more about the demographics? Are, is what you're seeing uh, universally applied amongst all young people or are there some groups for whom the effect is more pernicious than others? Yes, well, thank you. Um, what, what a pleasure to be 
in the last week, I've gotten a uh, uh, share or visiting request from so many people that I want to meet. I'm so sorry that I'm not there with you, uh, but I had to actually hide away to finish this book. Um, so here we are. Um, on your question, uh, so let me just give you the big picture here. Um, something happened around 2012. Um, it, it showed up, it began to show up with weirdness on campus in 2014. That led me and Greg Lukian up to write the Coddling of the American Mind article. We tried to figure out what caused this weird new morality, these terrible ideas. We thought maybe social media has something to do with it, but we didn't know in 2015. <laughs> then we wrote our book and uh, published in 2018, and now we had a little more evidence, but still it wasn't, it wasn't crystal clear in the, in the scientific literature. Um, and even today, it's not crystal clear when we look at the published research. But when we look all around us, you talk to the teachers, you talk to the psychologists, you talk to the parents, you talk to members of Gen Z, Nobody defends this phone-based childhood. <clears throat> Everybody sees the problems. Um, and what I have found, and Gene Twenge is a research partner here with me, um, is that the, if you plot out the trend lines for depression and anxiety, self-harm and suicide, <clears throat> they're relatively flat until around 2010. Um, and then all over the English-speaking world, they start shooting up around 2012 plus or minus a year. In fact, just 10 minutes ago, uh, uh, my research assistant and I put up a post showing that rates of suicide are at peak levels across the Anglosphere, but only for girls. Uh, so I think this is a real discovery. You'll, you, you'll see the post on my, on my Substack. Um, so anyway, I'm sorry to give you a, a, a shorter answer. What we're seeing um, is a very sharp, sudden um, uh, change in girls' mental health all around the Anglosphere and the Nordic countries. It's the same thing. Uh, and this will relate back to the previous talk. It's in those countries where there was a lot of independence and, and young people were not deeply rooted in communities, in religious communities, and in families. There's a lot of individualism. In those countries, when everything changed around 2012, all the kids got smartphones, or they all went on, the girls all went on Instagram. Um, it's right around then that in the, in, in the uh, Anglo and Nordic countries, the girls especially get washed away. And you cannot grow up in networks. You have to grow up in communities. Um, I'll just add two other variables to this when you asked about individual differences. Um, we have plots on some graphs I'll, I, I, I would show, or I'll, I'll, uh, you can find them in my Substack post, showing that it's especially, uh, it's not just girls, it's girls on the left and it's uh, secular conservatives. So if you are a religious, if, if you're a kid who's a religious conservative, on average, your mental health is not really much worse than it was 10 years ago. But if you're a secular liberal girl, you probably literally like more than half say uh, a mental, uh, I have been told that I have a mental health uh, problem. So those are the main demographics about what's happening. We're here to talk about the fragmentation of society and the future um, of what I think is the, the best way to live together, which is the the Anglo the the Anglo style uh, liberal democracy. But if we are if, if the next generation has such severe levels of anxiety and fragility, and has so little experience collaborating with people who think differently than them, for all the talk about diversity, many of them can't handle working with someone who voted the other way. Um, so. Uh, uh, yeah, I guess I'm here to bring more of this litany of bad news about current indicators. And I hope in our discussion, we'll, we'll be talking about how to turn that around. Right. So can you say a bit more about that? So you're saying amongst the young people who um, go to church, synagogue, or mosque, that they're less susceptible to the mental health side effects of social media than those who don't have religion in their lives. That's right. So there's several reasons for this. Um, so if we just focus on social media, it's uh, liberals use it more than conservatives, and liberal girls use it the most. So Gene Twenge says it might just be that the liberal girls are, are spend they spend so many hours a day on social media, and it's incredibly bad for your mental health. Whereas uh, conservative uh, uh, conservative religious kids don't. Um, but I think it's a lot more than that. And what I've learned while writing the book, so I began by focusing on social media, but I now see that it's not just social media. It's what I've been calling the phone based childhood. So for all of human history, for millions of years, you know, all mammals play. Like we, mammal childhood is about building up your brain, and you do that through play. Anyone who's had a puppy knows it's all about play. Um, so we had play-based childhoods up until around 2010. Uh, I've seen data in Britain 
I can't remember the exact numbers, but it was something like, you know, 60% of British kids in 20, 2009, 2010, 60% of them used to go over to a friend's house uh, sometimes, you know, each week. And then by 2015, that had dropped to something like 20%. I may be wrong on the numbers, but the thing is, kids used to actually see each other in person. And once they all got phones and loaded with social media for the girls, uh, it's video games for the boys, childhood stops being play-based, which is what a mammal brain needs to wire up properly. It stops being play-based. It becomes phone-based, where phone includes video game consoles, all the stuff that makes your, your social interactions virtual, often asynchronous, disembodied, uh, transitory. Um, so it's a complete, what I'm, I'm calling it, the great rewiring of childhood. It happened between 2010 and 2015. It hit the US, Canada, Britain, Australia, New Zealand, exactly the same way. The, the, uh, New Zealand's a little bit later, but the US, UK, Canada are exactly in lockstep about what happened to our kids' mental health. Now, does the research say anything about which platforms are better than others? I mean, for, for example, I, I can't imagine, I've got two teenage boys, 13 and 15. I've got a girl who's 10 years old, just young enough for me to have read your research and stop her from what lies ahead. But, um, but, but do you find, for example, that, um, that Instagram is more pernicious than, I don't know, Twitter? I guess kids don't really use LinkedIn, but, but you know, it, it's, you, you've got to be careful to, use, to, to lump all social media together. Yeah. That's right. So a, a really helpful distinction can be made between what we used to call these things, which were social networking systems. Networks are useful to adults. There's no doubt about that. LinkedIn is very useful. People use it to advance their purposes. So all of these things, including Facebook, used to be called social networking systems. You can do a Google trend search on that, and you'll see the term rose very high. And then that term begins to drop in the 2010. We don't call them that anymore. Um, after 2009, the, um, they became much more viral. We got the like button, the retweet button. It's not about connecting people. It's now about performing on a platform. And so we now call them social media platforms. Now, platforms can be useful to adults too if you want to yell and scream and shout and promote your brand. So these things are not very good for adults, but we let adults make their choices. Um, um, what about kids? Should, so, should children grow up playing with each other and sometimes getting into arguments and fights between the two of them and then working it out? Or is it better if they all stand on a platform where they can say things in public, including to strangers, uh, and then they can be publicly shamed by potentially millions of people? <clears throat> um, some of those kids then commit suicide. Um, the case of Molly Russell in the UK is, is the famous one, but we have many, many in the US as well. Um, so uh, to give a more concise answer, um, social networks are useful for adults I don't believe social networks are useful at all for children. Children should not be on social networks. They should be playing in person. Social media platforms should never be accessed by children until they're 18. Um, it's just insane that we let kids do these things that can ruin their lives. Um, uh, so so uh, Instagram is the worst for teen mental health for girls because of the social comparison. Uh, and also there's all kinds of new forms of bullying that take place on Instagram. TikTok uh, is probably the worst for their intellectual development. I think it, it literally reduces their ability to focus on anything while stuffing them with little bits of stuff that was selected by an algorithm for emotional arousal, uh, not for truth, for emotional arousal. I don't know if you talked about this yet at the conference, but the fact that uh, almost half of American Gen Z says, if given the choice between do you support Israel, or do you side more with Israel or Hamas, which way do you go? Well, the great majority of Americans side with Israel, except for Gen Z, which is split 50-50. And there was a Twitter thread recently showing how if you, if you look at what people are seeing on TikTok, you can understand why. TikTok is probably the most, uh, TikTok and Twitter are incredibly dangerous for our democracy. I'd say they're incompatible with the kind of liberal democracy that we developed over the last few hundred years. Uh, but Instagram is the worst for girls' mental health. But if, say, somebody listening to you here thinks, okay, my, this is my big takeaway from ARC, I'm going to go home and tell my kids to stop using social media, we can imagine the response. They'll say, look, mm -hmm. dad, mom, you are basically severing me from my social network. You don't understand how it is. A social network is digitized now. Yep. So, so you're basically a generation behind. It's, it's, like, it's like grand saying that you're watching television too much. You're telling me I use social enough. If you do this, that's it. My social life goes. Thank you. That's a perfect statement of what we call a collective action problem. Uh, in, in the social sciences, especially economics, there's a lot of research on collective action problems. It's just what you described. Any one person doing the right thing is in big trouble. Uh, nobody wants to have their kid be isolated. 
Why do we ever let our kids on social media? It's only because of the dynamic you just said. And what that means is that we have to look to the literature on how you solve collective action problems. And the main ways are you, if you can set norms and if you can have laws and policies. So I'd like to set a norm right here. Um, um, here's a very, here, so I'm suggesting four norms in my book. And, and these are all ways to solve collective, collective action problems. And we can all do them, even though the US Congress may never do anything to help us. Although of course the UK parliament is, is doing great work. Here they are. Uh, norm number one, um, uh, no smartphones before high school, which in the US is, is grade nine, around age 14. Just don't give your kids a smartphone, but they'll be cut off. No, you give them a flip phone. The millennials had flip phones. They texted each other, see you at four at the mall, and then they would meet at the mall. Um, so just don't give a smartphone to your, to your 10-year-old. Wait till 14 wait, or high school. Um, we have to think about especially saving elementary school and what we call middle school. Uh, if we can get the phones out of there, the collective action problem is solved, and those kids will not have phone-based childhoods. Rule number two, um, no social media before 16. Um, so if it's, you know, if your kid is the only one who's not on Instagram at, at 12, it's very hard on her. Um, but what if half the kids are not on Instagram? Now, do you feel as a parent, you could say, well, you know what? Half, half the kids in your grade are on Instagram, half are not. No, no, you're not getting this till you're 16. Um, the kids are terrified of being the only one cut off, left out. But if half the kids are not on social media and they actually meet up after school and do fun things, they'll become the cool kids. Um, third rule, um, phone-free schools. Get phones out of schools. And I've got to say, once again, uh, the UK, and spe well, in I don't know, you know England, uh, the, your health minister, or your education minister, I'm sorry, declared that all schools in England should go phone-free. I just want to put in the plug that that does not mean uh, you can keep it in your backpack. That's better than nothing, but really to make it phone-free because the kids are so addicted, it needs to be, you put them in a locked uh, a, a phone locker or in a yonder pouch. Otherwise, the kids are going to go to the bathroom. They'll find ways to get their fix. Um, that's rule three, phone preschools. And rule four is far more free play uh, and uh, for unsupervised play and childhood independence. Both of our countries freaked out in the 90s, locked up our kids because of we, we lost trust in each other. We thought everyone's a child molester or rapist. Uh, there's a great book, Paranoid Parenting by Frank Ferretti, British sociologist. Um, so those, that's it. If we do those four things, and if even if half of us do them, we solve the collective action problems. Right. Now, in your um, in much of your work, you especially in the righteous mind, you've emphasised how important it is to pay attention to those who disagree with you on the other ends of the spectrum. Now, there are people here who say what you're talking about is largely imagined. Can you um, talk a bit about the, the robustness? How sure are you of this? I mean, we know, for example, that mental health has been destigmatized in the last mm -hmm. 10, 15 years. That is, by and large, a very good thing. So people are way, way more likely to report mental health problems now. Um, and right. the phrase, it's okay not to be okay, is now fairly standard amongst young people. So might it be that what you're observing is just simply the end of the stigma uh, and the people being a bit more open-minded, a bit more recognizing that people can come in and out of good or bad mental health rather than a tech-induced breakdown of childhood? Certainly. So um, that seemed like a plausible hypothesis to me um, while I was writing The Righteous Mind with Greg Lukianoff. But once we found all the data on self-harm and suicide, um, now that explanation no longer works. So, you know, what you're suggesting, and this is what many people said all the way up. Some people still say it today, very few though. Uh, but before COVID, a few medical people were saying, oh, no, it's, you know, just what you said. It's just that they're, they're, they're self-diagnosing at higher rates, but it's not, it's not an underlying change, change in mental health. Um, well, why is it then? Right around 2013, in the US, Canada, Britain, Australia, New Zealand, all these girls suddenly start checking in to psychiatric inpatient units. Um, all suicide, they're making many more suicide attempts. Uh, the, the level of self-harm goes up by two or three hundred percent, two or three hundred percent increases, especially for the younger girls, age 10 to 14. Um, so no, that idea that it's just a change in self-report doesn't hold any water because we see very much the same curves at the same time for behavior, and suicide certainly is not a self-report variable. So no, this is real. This is the biggest, um, well, it's certainly the biggest mental health crisis in, in all of known history uh, for kids. Um, and I, I need to collect the data on, uh, you, know, uh, you know, how many kids died from COVID, how many kids died even from polio. Um, the increased number of suicides since 2010 is so large that I suspect this is 
uh, among the among the largest public health threats to children since the major diseases were wiped out. Well, well I could talk about this all day, but sadly we have to wrap it up now. Majoran, it's great to see you working away in your book. When can we expect it? Life after Babel is called, isn't it? Yes. March 26th is when it comes out in the U.S. I believe it'll come out in the U.K. at the same time. And I'm just making arrangements now um, for a visit to the U.K. I'll probably be in London on um, April 29th, of that week, whatever that week is of April 12th. Well, we can all so save the I hope there'll be some events in London. I hope to, to see some of you then and there. Well, great. Well, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Please, everybody, join me in thanking Jonathan Heiss. And finally, Toby Young writes in this week's magazine that the conversion therapy bill is a bad idea. Sunak has flip-flopped over the proposed ban, and recent reports suggest a draft bill, I mean to ban the practice, might be in the King's speech. To explain why he's against it, Toby joins me now. Brilliant. Toby, thank you for coming on Spectator TV. Um, you write in your column this week about the conversion therapy ban, which keeps appearing and disappearing, but now reports are that it might appear in the King's speech. Um, Start us off, uh, explain to, you know, to, to viewers, uh, some of them might think, you know, conversion therapy, obviously a very bad thing. What's wrong with a ban? What's your opposition to this, to this potential bill? Well, the reason I'm opposed to it is not because I'm in favour of conversion therapy. Um, the, 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 but the plain fact is that conversion therapy, as commonly understood, using force or coercion or violence or um, uh, robbing someone of their liberty momentarily to try and convert them from being gay to being straight. That's already illegal in this country, has been for years. Um, so what is it that this bill is purporting to ban, given that conversion therapy is already unlawful? And the answer seems to be, we haven't seen the bill yet, it hasn't been published, and I'm hoping the government will have another change of heart and not publish it. One reason for writing my column about it. Um, but it, it looks as though they want to emulate what happened in the state of Victoria in Australia. So in 2021, Victoria passed a conversion therapy ban, and like the UK, Victoria had laws in place already banning what we commonly think of as conversion therapy. Where it went beyond the existing law is it banned things like uh, religious leaders, um, uh, asking um, uh, members of their congregation who were experiencing feelings of sexual attraction to someone of the same sex to pray with them, to try and um, uh, uh, escape that temptation, resist that temptation, or engaging in trying to pressurise them uh, not to uh, indulge these desires, or asking other members of the congregation to pray on their behalf. All of that is now illegal in the state of Victoria and can, 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 it can lead to a prison sentence of up to 10 years and a fine of £100,000. But where it gets really alarming, I think you know, the Free Speech Union is obviously very concerned about um, uh, uh, curtailing the free speech of religious leaders and, and mandating what they can and can't say. In the state of Victoria, there's even guidance issued by the state on how to pray. So right. to keep your prayers lawful, because some prayers are now unlawful, which is pretty extraordinary, but that's, that's where they've got to in the state of Victoria. But more worrying than that, or at least equally worrying, is that in the state of Victoria, trying to dissuade uh, an adolescent who is confused about their gender, suffering from gender dysphoria, still described as a mental illness in you know, uh, uh, the, the, the Bible of the American psychiatric profession. Mm. Um, if you try and talk that child out of taking puberty blockers or having irreversible medical procedures such as a double mastectomy. If you do anything other than just affirm their self-diagnosis and send them on their send them on a medical pathway that they want to be sent on, anything mm. other than that is illegal mm. in the state of Victoria, particularly if the child can claim they've been harmed as a result of being frustrated in their efforts to transition. So if they begin to self-harm after being denied puberty blockers by a doctor, uh, then the doctor could be prosecuted, end up spending 10 years in jail. Hasn't happened yet. There hasn't in a test case, but the worry is it could happen. Mm -hmm. um, the government think that they've got some clever wording they can include in the bill uh, to safeguard against that risk and in fact make it harder for doctors to affirm the self-diagnosis of gender-confused children, to protect, you know, people like Kira Bell who had surgery and later came to mm -hmm. regret it. Um, but I think, I think the government is naive. I think as soon as the bill is published, uh, the LGBTQ lobby in the House of Commons, which is extremely influential, even within the Conservative Parliamentary Party, will bring its influence to bear. And however many protections there are for trans kids in the bill, how much protection there is for religious freedom, that'll all be uh, weeded out by the LGBT lobby and their MPs. And it'll end up, I think, I fear, being very like the conversion therapy ban that really 
dogmatic, draconian conversion therapy ban in the state of Victoria. Now, the government say, well, if that happens, we'll just, we'll just pull the bill. Mm. What are you worried about? You know, we, think we, can, we think we can keep those things out, and we think we can come up with a good bill, be better than what Labour would do, which is a silly reason for legislating, I think. Mm. Of all sorts of <laughs> silly yes. Do. It's quite defeatist, too. Plus, I don't think Labour would necessarily do it if the Conservatives don't do it. I mean, the Labour Party is probably even more divided mm. on this issue than the Conservative Party. And, you know, Keir Starmer doesn't want to open that can of worms. But anyway, to, just, just to finish this point, the government say, well, if the bill, if the bill is corrupted by the LGBTQ lobby, we'll just pull it. Uh, but I think once they've published the bill, once they've acknowledged, once they've effectively said that gay and lesbian and trans children are at risk of harm at present and we need to legislate mm. to protect them from harm, it would then be very difficult to pull the bill, politically very difficult indeed. So I think once this genie has been let out of the bottle, it'll be very hard to put it back in and I'm afraid it'll end up looking like the Victorian conversion therapy ban. Mm, I mean, so it's, it's a very good question, which is that if this is going to open, this is going to let the genie out of the bottle, as you say. Um, why is Rishi Sunak introducing this in the first place? I mean, you mentioned it as sort of a ham-fisted progressivism, but who do you think Rishi Sunak is trying to impress here or keep on side? <laughs> yeah, it's a good question. Um, I imagine that um, some of his officials are quite keen on it. Mm. Um, uh, the chief whip is keen on it. Um, uh, Alicia Kearns is keen on it. I think a couple of ministers have threatened to resign um, if he if he doesn't bring forward a conversion therapy bill. Mm. I think the compromise is, well, it's not going to be in the King's speech. We'll just publish the bill now, and it'll be subjected to pre-legislative scrutiny, uh, but we don't intend to pass it in this parliament. If we win the next general election, then perhaps we will. If we don't, well, then the next government will have an oven-ready bill to pass. Oh. That's sort of the, 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 the rationale as why this is somehow some sort of compromise that will keep everyone happy. Uh, I, I, I think he should call the bluff of the ministers who threatened to resign, including the chief whip, and say, OK, do your worst. I'm not going to publish this bill. It's going to drive Conservative voters uh, into the arms of the Reform Party in various uh, marginal constituencies. It's, it's, it could be electorally disastrous. I mean, a lot of the former 2019 Conservative voters who have gone elsewhere have gone elsewhere because they care mm -hmm. about these culture war issues. They worry that the party is too woke. It's not doing enough to protect trans children. If the government really wants to protect, you know, gender-confused children, pass a bill banning uh, puberty blockers, irreversible medical procedures of all kinds um, uh, being inflicted on anyone under the age of 18 before they can actually fully consent to it. That, that, that I think, would be very popular. Yeah, and it seems to me that the trans issue is where it's most pertinent with this bill in the sense of there are large numbers of children who have gender dysphoria but who no, do not do not go on to become trans. I mean, I know that number's delated, you know, debated, yeah. but it's, it's a substantially large number. Is that your yeah. kind of main concern with the bill, do you think? It, 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 well, in the state of Victoria, I learnt um, when talking to an MP from the state of Victoria who I met at ARC earlier this week called Moira Deeming. Um, and she's currently been expelled from the Liberal Party for, for speaking out on this issue. Um, and um, she said that it's perfectly possible that a parent who tries to dissuade their child from taking puberty blockers um, could be prosecuted, particularly if the child uh, can claim to have suffered harm as a result of that conversation, including psychological harm. Mm. So quite a low bar. Mm. Um, and a bill which effectively says to parents, you can't you can't tell your children what you think is in their best interest. And we know that there are all sorts of risks associated with puberty blockers. They're often presented as just a stopgap measure. So the adolescent can have a bit longer to make up their minds about whether they want to have hormone treatment, how seriously, how serious they are about transitioning. But actually, they do have, in some cases, long-term irreversible effects. They can cause permanent sterility. Uh, they can, they can um, cause damage to your bones. They can impair your cognitive development. They're not the, the harmless, you know, wait and see, just press the pause button drug that they're often presented as being. If, my, if one of my children said to me they wanted to take puberty blockers, the thought that I wouldn't be able to sort of set out the case to them as to why I think that's a bad idea mm. without risking prosecution is, is horrific. It's just not an area the state should be trying to interfere in. Well, that I think brings me on to my next point, which is, do you think there is a bit of a problem in government that the sort of various lobbies say something must be done and therefore that leads to legislation and, and the government is falling for that trap in general? Well, um, uh, I mean, I, 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 I think I care more, I think, about this issue than anything else the government is proposing to do. Um, I think that if they do uh, let this genie out of the bottle, 
um, it'll have really serious implications for uh, not just the conversations between doctors and patients, but between parents and children, and it'll also have serious implications for religious freedom. Mm. Um, uh, it, it, it's, it's a massive escalation in the power, the responsibility that the state is taking on. Interfering in family life in this way, I think, is really outrageous. Um, and I really hope that Rishi Sunak can be persuaded to um, abandon this idea. We already had, I think, you know, me and gender critical feminists and various free speech advocates. We, we, I think we got Rishi in the right place. We mm. persuaded them that this was a silly idea. We thought like we'd driven yes. a stake through its heart, but like Dracula. It appears to have come <laughs> roaring back to life. And uh, we need to you know, get out the garlic and the crucifixes and try and finally finish it off, I think. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Toby. That's it for this week. Uh, once again, if you enjoy Spectator TV, do subscribe to our YouTube channel. Just click the subscribe button at the bottom of this video and tap the bell icon so you never miss an episode. I would also like to thank our sponsors, Canaccord Genuity Wealth Management. Canaccord are experienced wealth planners and investment managers who offer unwavering support during challenging times. Visit candowealth.com for more information. Thanks again for watching and do join us again next week. Thank you.